I've titled this part of symbiosis, Can You Provide Me With Free Housing in Exchange for My Services? This is a description of a particularly interesting mutualistic relationship. These relationships often involve ants, a highly social insect, and plants. Both of them provide services and or resources for each other. There's a great YouTube to look at, and I've highlighted its URL down here below. What the plant provides is a home, a home to raise a family in this social insect. Here you see it carved out a cross section of a stem with the ant inside nurturing several eggs. Often at the base of a thorn, there is an opening, and into that opening, the insect can crawl in, hollow out the material, and create its home. In turn, the ant provides some services, protection from other insects, protection from other plants. We can see some of this protection here in this diagram here. On this acacia tree, we have a series of ants that are protecting the tree from insects that might land, but also from plants that might grow in the vicinity of this acacia tree that might be competitors. So the ants are very aggressive at taking out all of the other plants and creating this open space where there are no neighbors, reducing the competition for the acacia. In return, the ant provides protection while the acacia provides a food resource. Now these mutualistic <clears throat> plant-animal or plant-ant interactions might also involve a third component, a fungus, in which plants, uh, plant parts are brought back in and the fungus decomposes those materials, making energy carbohydrates available to the ants. So here you might have a mutualistic symbiotic relationship that involves the plant, the ant, and a fungus. Now, acacia ant, uh, acacias provide ants with uh, food bodies that are exclusive rewards. So here we find <clears throat> that these food bodies provide a carbohydrate-rich source of food. It turns out that in the ants, they're able to break away the protease that inhibits growth, uh, that reduces the growth in the digestive tract, whereas in those ants that are not adapted, the protease has a negative impact on the release of carbohydrates and protein. A young plant needs to attract a queen ant to establish a colony on the plant. And so that's done by the emission of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, a smell. The stronger the smell, the more likely it is that a female ant will be attracted. So in this symbiotic relationship, the plant needs to be able to attract the ant. It does attract queen ants on the basis of the strength of the VOC, or volatile organic compound. This healthy acacia, now that it is a population of ants, needs to be able to ward off other insects, caterpillars and so forth, that might be chewing on the leaves. So to incentivize the ant to provide a chemical defense, it provides a nectar reward. And in return for this nectar reward, the plant wards off all of the other insect predators. So this is a co-evolutionary relationship that has emerged, emerged over many thousands and tens of thousands of generations. And it's a relationship in which the ant benefits, it gets a resource, it gets a home, and the plant benefits. It is, has reduced herbivory and a reduction in the number of competitors. Probably the neatest example I can think of was from research by an undergraduate here in biology at the University of Utah. This student was interested in a plant whose name I absolutely love, Dishidia major from Indonesia. And here you see Dishidia. 
When I first saw this, I had to say, this is the shittiest plant I've ever seen in my life. And of course, that's appropriate for a genus named Deschidia. These are actually leaves. They are leaves that grow and circle around and form a cone. Inside of that cone, we'll often find roots. They're not there to begin with, but they grow after an insect has begun to live inside the cavity. So what's going on here? Well, this is work that was done by uh, none other than Kathleen Tresseter when she was an undergraduate biology student here at the University of Utah. She was captivated, based on her tropical ecology experience, by Deschidia, a very interesting epiphyte in Indonesia. Kathleen now has a faculty position at the University of California, Irvine. She's a very well-regarded, internationally recognized scientist. She's also the chair of the Department of Ecology at UC Irvine, one of the strongest ecology institutions in North America. For her project, she began to evaluate the interactions between the insect, ant, and the plant. It turns out, as I mentioned, these ants have a leaf that circles around and forms a cavity. What we notice is that the stomates are located on the inside. They're not located on the outside. By being located on the inside, when an ant comes in and the ant respires as part of the colony growth, that carbon dioxide, that enriched level of carbon dioxide, is taken up by the plant. The plant, in return, provides this home for the ant. The ants bring in insect parts and other decaying materials, and in this moist environment, those materials begin to decompose. As those materials decompose, the nitrogen released from that interaction is taken up by the plant, taken up by roots that begin to grow inside the cavity once the cavity is occupied by ants. So the plant is able to, to form this cavity, to detect when an ant is present, to open its stomates to take advantage of the respiration from the ant, and then as, as insect parts and decomposing material comes into this cavity, a root grows in to take advantage of this. An incredibly interesting system. But what Kathleen did was a little bit more. She showed, using stable isotope analyses, that nearly 40% of all the carbon associated with growth came from ant breath. Can you believe that? 40% of all the respiration came from the exhalation associated with ant respiration. And nearly 30% of all the nitrogen in that leaf came from the decomposition of insect parts and materials that the ant brought in. And so I call this an example of ecological etiquette. Polite house guests such as ants, always bring their hosts a gift in the form of nitrogen, in the form of carbon. Now, what's sort of a culmination of this young woman when she was working here at the University of Utah is that she published her results in a very prestigious journal, the journal Nature. Moreover, the cover of Nature that week was a picture of Kathleen and her research all inspired by an undergraduate research experience here at the University of Utah. And I encourage all of you to become engaged in research at one level or the next as part of your undergraduate experience. Maybe it's in the medical school. Maybe it's in chemistry. Maybe it's in biology. Maybe it's in the lab. Maybe it's in the field. Maybe it's in experimental work. Maybe it's a theoretical work. But if you're going to become engaged in the biological sciences, get outside of the classroom experience 
and enjoy the excitement of conducting original research, as Kathleen did some 20 years ago.